So coming up in lecture two, part two, how to design a research topic and how to design your research question. It's 35 degrees outside, so let's get a wiggle on, eh? Shut up and sit down. Okay, so this is part two in our lecture, uh, series two, lecture two, part two of lecture two, which is all about planning and designing research. And in this part, we'll be focusing on how you design your research topic and how you design your research question. Now, you don't have to do either of these things for assessment one, but you do for assessment two. Now, your research topic is your broad area of interest. For assessment one, I've chosen the topic for you. That topic is the social environmental factors that negatively impact university students' mental health. You are mentally deranged. Now, when you choose a topic, you want to first make sure it's current and relevant. Um, and good places to look are newspapers, um, watching the news on the TV, um, reading online publications like The Conversation. So. Also, you can get to know the issues that are current and relevant uh, for your surrounding community. So council newsletters and activities of local community groups and organisations and so on. And you can also focus on interests that you've developed as part of your work or study, though these may not be current or relevant to people outside of your work or your study group. So be careful of that. Now, the key here is to make sure you watch the news. If you don't, it's very hard to choose a research topic that's current and relevant to anyone other than yourself or your immediate network. Now, once you've got a topic and if you're a qualitative researcher, you need to decide whether it's the sort of topic area or issue that invites qualitative methods. So the question you should ask is whether the topic or issue involves people's lived experience and as such, can you ask people about their experience of it? So student mental health is a lived, lived issue. It's people something, people something people experience. It's etchings of time, man. These guys have really lived, you So know? you can certainly ask students about that lived experience. Now, if it isn't something that you can ask people about in terms of their lived experience, you wouldn't ordinarily drop the topic you would drop your methodology, switch to, say, a quantitative approach. Now, that's not something you can do on this unit because, you know, we're here to learn about and get some practice with using qualitative methodology. And that's because we're doing research as part of your training as a researcher. You'll be able to do all the research you want. Now, outside of research undertaken for the training of researchers, we shouldn't dump the topic just so that we can stick with our methodology, our preferred methodology. That's been called methodolatry. It's the practice of allowing the method to drive the area of inquiry. So in the real world, if you are a qualitative researcher, you're faced with a topic that can only be researched quantitatively. Ignore my phone pinging. <laughs> that didn't happen. Now I've drawn attention to it, you know what happened. <laughs> anyway, getting back to the point. Um, so. In the real world, yeah, if, if it was a topic that was only really amenable to quantitative methodology, you'd either recruit a quantitative researcher to assist you or else give your project to a team who's got the required skill in quantitative methods. So next, we need to make sure that the topic is of psychological interest. Now, this is of particular importance if you're doing research as part of your programme of study. So if you undertake an honours degree in psychology, you undertake a research project and that research project has to be related to psychology. I'm going to study psychology. This is because your degree is in psychology. Same for research done for a master's degree and for a PhD in psychology. When you're an academic, you can research outside of the discipline, but that might not help you advance your career in psychology because you're not undertaking psychological research. Now, luckily for psychology and for us is that psychology is a broad discipline and you can encompass a lot of different topic areas. I can be whatever I want to be. Now, you also need to make sure that the research matches your skill level. For honours students, 
a key mistake that students often make is to take on an ethically sensitive area. And it's a mistake because at that point in students' education, they've, they've not really demonstrated that they've mastered and finessed their research skills. Now, if you take on high-risk ethics, say, um, so high-risk ethics would be working with people who are not able to give legal consent, such as children, or when the topic is socially highly sensitive or linked to criminal activity, such as rape, or working with groups who have historically been ill-treated or exploited, such as indigenous people, and so on. Um, that's, these are all high-risk areas, highly sensitive, ethically sensitive research areas. Now, we'll go into these issues in more detail in week six, where we're going to focus on the issue of working with indigenous people. Now, why is it a mistake to take on an ethically sensitive topic in your honours research? Well, if you're new to research, you're likely to make mistakes. You know, um, that's how most of us learn. But if you make mistakes when you're researching ethically sensitive topics, those mistakes can be very, very costly. You know, they can put people at risk of harm. So if you study child abuse and you haven't, sufficient, haven't had sufficient experience in dealing with issues of confidentiality, you may break a confidence or maintain a silence in a way that puts people at risk of harm. Now, the other problem is that if you are undertaking a research project, primarily for educational purposes, it's part of your degree program. Taking on an ethically sensitive project is a very bad idea because your main purpose is that the project will enable you to graduate. And if you hit an ethical dilemma, you might be forced to stop your research and that will put your prospects of graduating on hold. Graduation. And no one's going to allow your ambition to graduate to override the ethical obligations you have in the research. Now, the other issue with honours research is time. For honours, you typically only really have around seven months to do the research. So if you're engaging in ethically sensitive research, um, you might not have enough time because it takes a lot of time when you're engaged in ethically sensitive topics when you're doing research. Typically, it might take you two or three months just to get the initial ethical clearance. And if you've got seven months to complete the project, you've lost a whole chunk of time. We are running out of time. Now, you have your topic. Next, you need to formulate your question. So our topic is student mental health. But that is a topic and it's not a question. You know, if you, if you approach someone and say, student mental health, they will look at you oddly and say, well, have you got a question? So how do you get to your question? Well, there are two approaches. You can brainstorm with other people to see if you can come up with something and then go to the research literature and see if it's already been asked. Now, when you're just starting out in research, this is not a good idea, as you will more often than not come up with a question that has already been answered by other people. And I believe I have already answered that question. So what you do is you'll brainstorm a question you go to the literature, you find the questions already been answered. So you go, go back and brainstorm another question. You go to the literature, you find out it's already been answered and so on and so on. Yeah, it just goes on forever. Um, so the other way of doing... So brainstorming, really, you really only want to be engaging in that if you already have a really thorough understanding of the research literature on your research topic. Now, the second way to go about finding your research question is to read key research papers on the topic and see if you can find a gap in the literature. Is there a question that appears not to have yet been answered? And this is probably the way you'd be working for around the first five or even ten years of your research um, career or whatever career you're doing if you're engaged in uh, any form of research. So it's the approach we're going to take. Um, so assessment two, what your task is to find free research papers on a topic of your choosing and then to develop a research question from those papers to see if you can find a question that hasn't yet been properly addressed in the papers that you've read. 
Now, for assessment one, you're not expected to fully immerse yourself in the literature on student mental health. I've done that for you. I've done that, um, yeah, not just for you, but this is an area I know about. Um, so I'll be helping you with formulating your research question that will inform how you develop your interview questions for assessment one. I don't know if you can see this, there's this tiny little fly buzzing around. Now, if I render this in 4K, you'll see it. <laughs> but if it's just in HD, or if you're watching this in a lower resolution, you won't see it. But if you see my, my eyes are wandering around at times, I am tracking a very small fly in a benign way, not a predatory way. I, I intend to cause that fly no harm unless it's a mosquito, in which case I might persuade it to leave my studio. Oh, distracted. Let's get on with it. Come on. Oh, it's heating up here. I'm sweating again. So, now, now there, now there are seven types of qualitative research questions. And if you think back to week one, you'll remember that qualitative and quantitative research ask very different types of questions. In qualitative research, our questions are ones that help us understand, describe, map, and explore the research topic. They're questions that start with a what, or a how, or a why. They're not questions that start with a would you, should you, or did you. You know, questions that beckon a one-word answer, like, did you go for coffee this morning? Yes. One-word answer. Doesn't tell you an awful lot, does it? What are you not telling me? Those are known as closed questions, but we'll talk about that um, prior to our residential school and prior to assessment one, when you're developing those interview questions for yourself. So the seven broad types of questions. First experience, example would be, what is it like to be a student? Type two, understanding and perceptions. For example, what do you think about student mental health? Type 3 is practices and behaviours. For example, tell me how you deal with stress as a student. Number 4, influencing factors. For example, what impacts your levels of stress as a student? Uh, type 5, representation. For example, what does it mean to be a student with poor mental health? Type 6, construction. E.g., how do people construct meaning? That's not an EG, that's an explanation, sorry. <laughs> Let's go back on that. I was doing so well. I'm dreadful with lists. It's because the numbers, the numbers put me off. So type six, construction, for example. No, it's not for example. I've done the same mistake. So, so construction, this is about how people construct meaning. An example would be how do, asking someone, how do students understand mental health? No, why I got stuck on this one, tripped over this one, is because it's similar to understanding, but this time it's about other people's understanding. It's not about the participants' understanding. So that's why you're asking, how do people think about it, rather than how do you think about it? And number seven, we got there. Number seven, language practice. An example would be, how do students talk about mental health? So, here are three examples of topics and questions. So first is an experience type question. The second is an influencing, influencing factors type question. And the third is another experience type question. Now, we do have one tricky thing to um, get through. Some people talk about research aims and it can be difficult distinguishing research aims from research um, topics or questions. Now, when you write a research proposal in the real world, you'll be asked to describe your research aims as well as your research questions. And in our textbook, they use the terms research aims and research questions a little interchangeably and also sometimes they talk about the authors talk about research objectives now i want you to be clear that these things are actually different things and that's why in assessment three i'm going to be asking you to identify research aims and a research question so what the heck 
is going on here? What's the difference? Well, aims are the things that you hope to achieve in your research. It's the purpose of your research. Now, obviously, you want to answer your research question, but that's just one part of your broader aim. You know, your aim is much broader than that. So here's an example. A research aim would be wanting to find clear and effective messages that increase people's emotional preparedness for, say, bushfires. Now, the research question would then be, which words, phrases and delivery methods work best to emotionally prepare people for bushfires? And also, we might ask how agencies currently understand emotional preparedness. So those are research questions that meet our research aim. So the aim is the point of us asking our research question. It's, it's an answer to the question, why are you asking that research question? Why are you asking people this thing? Why? Why? And why? The answer to that question is really what your research aim is. Because I'm trying to do this thing. And it goes beyond the response, why are you asking that question? Because I want to find the answer to it. You know, well, that is an aim, but it's a bit narrow. You need to broaden it out. What's the overall aim? What are you trying to do? George, what on okay. earth are you doing? Now, generally, you'd want your research questions, or your research question, to address an important and relevant issue that makes a positive contribution to people's lives. You would also want it to be filling a gap in the literature, telling us something we don't already know. And you'd also want it to, 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 um, to have some form of originality, to make some sort of original contribution. And that could be in relation to expanding an area of research that isn't present, is presently quite small or underdeveloped, or taking a new approach to an existing topic. Yeah, your dad has a different way of doing things. Now, the paper that we read in week two on heterosexual casual sex is a good example of that. It used qualitative research in an area that had only really received attention from quantitative research. And it also looked at heterosexual casual sex in a new way with a new sample, in this case using participants from New Zealand. So... There are lots of ways of being original. And usually it's quite important to try and be original. Because I'm original. You certainly are. <laughs> the only exception to that is where you want to replicate studies that have happened before. And that's really largely to do with the quantitative paradigm, where replication is an important thing. Um, but that's another topic. For generally, for qualitative, we're looking for something original. New angles, new ways of looking at things, new questions, new contexts, and so on. Stuff that hasn't been asked before. Now, as well as asking why the research is important and worth doing, we also need to consider the implications of doing the research. Here are a number of useful questions. The first question is a really powerful question. <coughs> Excuse me. In whose interest is it that we do this research? If the answer to that question is, it's in my interest, primarily it benefits me, um, it's going to help me get promotion at work or, for, or I could win some awards or I could be get, become famous, go on, get on the telly, stuff like that. Um, that's not a great answer, you know. It's all about me. If you're doing research for those purposes, then really? <laughs> Maybe get a different career. Uh, but it's a legitimate answer when you're doing research as part of your educational training, when you're doing it as part of your honours, if you go on to do honours, you know, it's, it's a reasonable quest, uh, answer there. Uh, because, yeah, you are doing it primarily uh, to benefit yourself, so you get a degree. And that's legitimate, that's okay, that's the way we've set up your research projects in an honours pro in an honours programme. But that, again, is why you want to stay well away from those ethically sensitive research topics in an honours research project because the answer to this question it is in my interest as it will help me obtain my honours degree that's fine but it looks really bad if you engage in ethically problematic research where there's a risk of your research causing harm to your participants and that's that's what ethically sensitive research is kind of about it's that engaging in 
a research topic that actually could cause harm. You've got to be really careful. Now you can also ask, who are the stakeholders in this project? And uh, this might be the people who are funding the research. You know, they've got a stake in the research. They've got vested interest in the research. But it's also those people who are going to be impacted by the findings of your research. So who are the stakeholders? And have you fully considered their interests and their needs, how those needs are going to be served by your research? Um, you also ask how the research could be interpreted and used. Could it be used to harm others? Now, in the case of politically or ethically sensitive research on a disempowered, marginalised community, you particularly got to think about this. Could this research end up damaging them? But when you're working with those groups, there are a number of other, other key questions you should ask yourself. One is about your group membership. Are you a member of that community that you'd like to undertake research with? You know, that disempowered, disadvantaged, marginalised community. If you aren't a member of that community, do you have a person from that community who wants to work with you? Second question is about participation. Has that community been involved in designing your research project? First, third question would be about support. Is there broad community support for your project? And the fourth uh, type of question to ask is about skill. Do you have the skills you need researching with marginalized groups on sensitive issues, in particular, the particular, in particular, the particular, in the, particularly with that particular group. Oh, I can't find another word other than particular. Ah, got it, nailed it. Here we go, look at my extensive vocabulary. Particularly when you're working with that specific group. Nailed it. Okay, but basically what I'm saying is, are you the best person to do this research? Now, if your answer is no to any of these questions, it's a sign that you don't really meet the ethical standards that are required to carry out that work. Now, for the assessments on this unit, we're going to keep well away from this type of ethically sensitive work. It's too risky for what we're wanting to do, which is to learn about how to do research. Now, we're talking about mental health. That is a sensitive topic, but we're going to stay well clear of asking students about their diagnosis. Are you diagnosed with mental illness? Do you take medications? What sort of medications do you take? You know, that's starting to get personal, starting to get sensitive, and um, we're gonna stay well clear of that, okay? So bear that in mind. Okay, now let's take a quick look at assessment two and connect that in with this presentation. So far, you should have the information you need to choose your research topic for assessment two and to know why, um, why you're going to go about, why you're going to read free research papers on the topic and how you're going to develop your research question. We're going to flesh it out a bit more, but just the basic reasons for what you're going to be doing in assessment two. That's kind of what this um, lecture two, part two has been about. We still need to talk it through a bit and, you know, that's what we'll be doing in week four, in the week four tutorial. You know, we'll start to test out your ability and skill in identifying a research question. I'm going to give a long lead in time, basically, for assessment two, so you're well practiced at this by the time you actually have to write about it and put in your assessment. Um, We've also already started to cover the learning we need for assessment three. Here's um, a little look at that. So assessment three is a long way off, but just want you to start thinking about how we have started covering um, in this um, um, yeah, video things that will help you with that assessment. Now, that was a big chunk of stuff, wasn't it? Um, now in part three of lecture two, I'm exhausted. <laughs> I get so tired. How long will we be going? Oh, yeah, this has been a long one. Um, so let, <laughs> let's wrap up now. Um, so part three of lecture two, the next video in this sequence, we'll be talking about um, how to sample. No, not the musical variety, but of the research variety. So I'm going to see you, hope to see you then. Until then, Ta-da!
microphone out was shot. Hey, who say? You know, you're never too, you're never too old to learn. Oh, I'm out of focus now, am I? <laughs> microphone out of shot. Professional. The, the microphone's down here, not up there this time. I discovered that putting it up there, the forces of gravity. Am I out of focus again? Oh, what am I doing? The forces of gravity are such that the microphone falls down. Now, having the microphone down here, the forces of gravity are working with me. You didn't know that I've got a sophisticated understanding of physics, did you? But yeah, I'd like to brag. Anyway, microphone's down here. Getting better, I hope. Leave me comments in the feedback box on YouTube um, if you want to encourage me to get better still. And if you haven't subscribed to my YouTube channel, subscribe. I want to get my subscriptions up.